In the previous episode, we covered Hannes Alfein's general properties and mechanisms in a double layer. In this episode, we will continue to explore his paper and focus on what experiments have revealed about the properties of double layer. At the beginning of the 20th century, geophysicists began to be interested in electrical discharges because it seemed possible that the aurora was an electrical discharge. Anyone who is familiar with electrical discharge in the laboratory and observes a really beautiful aurora cannot avoid noting the similarities between the multicolored flickering light in the sky and in the laboratory. Birkeland was the most prominent pioneer. He made his famous Torello experiment in order to investigate this possibility. Based on his experiment and on extensive observations of the aurora in the auroral region, he proposed a current system which is basically the same as is generally accepted today. At the time, the theory of electrical discharge was still in a very primitive state. When Sidney Chapman began his investigations on magnetic storms and aurora, one or two decades later, he proposed a current system which was located entirely in the ionosphere. His most important argument against Birkeland's current system was that above the atmosphere there was a vacuum, and hence there could be no electrons or ions which could carry any current. The interest in double layers made a great leap forward when Langmuir began his investigations. He introduced the term plasma in his paper Oscillations in Ionized Gases in 1928. Why he chose this term is not made clear, but was probably borrowed from medical terminology. All he stated was, we shall use the name plasma to describe this region containing balanced charges of ions and electrons. Langmuir also made the first detailed analysis of double layers. Towards the end of the 19th century, electrical discharges in gases began to attract increasing attention. They were studied in Germany and in England. As there were few international conferences, the Germans and the English made their discoveries independently. Langmuir's curiosity was all-embracing, his enthusiasm indiscriminate, he would examine whatever took his interest no matter where it took him. This could be anything from electrical discharges and plasmas to biological and geophysical phenomena. Science as fun was one of his cardinal tenets. From this you might get the impression that he was very superficial. This is absolutely not correct. He got the Nobel Prize in chemistry because he was recognised as the father of surface chemistry. He knew enough about biology to borrow the term plasma from this science, and the mechanism of double layers from surface chemistry. Langmuir's probes were of decisive value from the early exploration of plasma and double layers, and are still used today. Today, 90 years after Langmuir's work, most astrophysicists still have no knowledge of his work. In Sweden, the water power is located in the north and the industry in the south. The transfer of power between these regions over distances of about a thousand kilometers was done with AC. When it was realized that DC transmission would be cheaper and that it could also be used in underwater cables, mercury rectifiers were deployed. It turned out that such a system normally worked well, but it happened now and then that the rectifiers produced enormous overvoltages, so that the fat electric sparks filled the rectifying station and did considerable damage. In order to get rid of this, a collaboration started between the rectifier constructors and some plasma physicists at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. An arc rectifier must have a very low pressure of mercury vapour in order to stand the high back voltages during half of the AC cycle. On the other hand, it must be able to carry large currents during the other half cycle. It turned out that these two requirements were conflicting because at very low pressure the plasma could not carry enough current. If the current density is too high, an exploding double layer can form. This means that in the plasma an evacuated region is produced. The plasma refuses to carry any current at all. At the sudden interruption, some 100 to 1000 km inductance produces enormous overvoltages, which can ultimately be very destructive. In order to understand this better, a series of laboratory experiments were carried out while at the same time developing a theoretical model of the same phenomena. At low current densities, a drift motion VD is superimposed on the thermal velocity VT of the electrons in the plasma. At this stage, drift motion is less than the thermal velocity. 
If the current density increases so that the drift velocity becomes larger, the motion becomes similar to a beam, and an instability sets in which is related to the two-stream instability. This produces a double layer which may be relatively stable. If the voltage over the tube is increased in order to increase the current, the higher voltage is taken up by the double layer and the current is not increased. However, under certain conditions, the double layer may explode. A simple mechanism of the explosion is as follows. The double layer can be considered as a diode for electrons combined with a reverse diode for the ions, limited by a slab of plasma on the cathode side and another slab on the anode side. Electrons starting from the cathode get accelerated in the diode and impinge upon the anode slab with a considerable momentum which they transfer to the plasma. Similarly, accelerated ions transfer momentum to the cathode slab. When more energy is supplied from the outer circuit, the result is that the anode and the cathode plasma columns are pushed away from each other. When the distance between the electrons in the diode becomes larger than the drop in the voltage increase, this runaway phenomena leads to an explosion. Nowadays, the mercury arc rectifiers have been replaced by semiconductors, but this work led Hannes Alvin to an interesting spin-off in cosmic physics. In 1964, Jakobsen and Carl Quist suggested that the violent explosions of solar flares were produced by the same basic mechanism as was observed by the exploding rectifiers. It drew the attention to the fact that every inductive circuit carrying a current is intrinsically explosive. Further consequences were the obvious connection between the laboratory and space plasma led to a long series of plasma experiments planned to clarify cosmic phenomena. It inspired Carl Christ to work out a detailed theory of solar flares, and later to develop a theory of relativistic double layers. It inspired Bostrom to develop a theory of magnetic substorms. In most of the double layers in the magnetosphere, and those studied so far in the laboratory, the electrons and the ions have low energies, so that relativistic effects are usually not very important. In flares with voltages of 10 to the 9 volts or more, it is possible to reach the energies required. In galactic phenomena, we have voltages which are several orders of magnitude larger. Carl Christ found that in relativistic double layers, the distribution of charges can be divided into three regions. Two density spikes near the electrodes, and one intermediate region with almost constant charge density. In a later paper, Carl Christ gives examples of possible galactic double layer voltage differences of 10 to the 14 volts. This, by straightforward extrapolation from our knowledge of our cosmic neighborhood, means that we can derive an acceleration mechanism which brings us up to the energy region of cosmic radiation. A double layer that releases power must be part of a circuit in which a current flows. If we examine a simple circuit containing a double layer, which is depicted by D and L, written together with the L pointing in the direction of the current. Besides the double layer, the circuit contains an inductance in which energy is stored according to the following formula. Where Bi is the magnetic field produced by the current I and DT is the volume element. If a magnetized plasma with a field BO moves with a velocity V in relation to the circuit, it produces an EMF in the circuit given by this equation, where DS is a line element in the direction of I. If the EMF is greater than zero, we have a generator transferring plasma power into the circuit. If the EMF is less than zero, we have a motor transferring circuit energy into kinetic energy of the plasma. Finally, the circuit may contain a resistance R, which dissipates power into heat. A normal circuit consists essentially of metal wires. So is it realistic to use this for cosmic plasma? Probably not. There are obviously no metal wires in space, and most of the circuit elements we are interested in will be distributed across cosmic distances. There have been many detailed studies made concerning the relation between the kinetic energy of a plasma and currents, which give a deeper understanding of these processes than a circuit approach. However, the purpose is not to study the detailed problems, but to get a general survey of the energy transport in cosmical physics. In this respect, the circuit approach may be useful as a first approximation of these problems. A map of a city is useful despite the fact that it does not show all of the houses. In space, charged particles move more easily parallel to the magnetic field rather than perpendicular, 
and parallel currents are often pinched to filaments. A wire is not too bad an approximation to a pinched filament. Also, the generator slash motor, as well as the double layer, are often confined to a relatively small volume. The circuit representation could and must be developed in many respects. One important observation is that a theory of certain phenomena need not necessarily be expressed in the traditional language of differential equations. It could also be expressed as an equivalent circuit. The pioneer in this field was Bostrom, who summarized his theory of magnetic substorms in the following circuit. If this method is developed further, it is quite possible that it will be recognized as the best way to represent energy transfer in cosmic plasmas. Every circuit which contains an inductance is intrinsically explosive. The inductive energy can be trapped at any point of the circuit. If we try to interrupt the current, the inductance tends to supply its energy to the point of interruption, where the power is delivered. This means that most of the circuit energy may be released in a double layer, and if large, it can cause an explosion of the double layer. In a laboratory plasma, this occurs due to a region of negative resistance in the current voltage characteristics of the double layer. Consider a long, homogeneously magnetized uniform plasma. It is confined laterally by a tube wall or by a magnetic field. It carries no longitudinal current. Information, or energy, is transmitted in a time t from one end to the other by sound waves or hydromagnetic waves or by diffusion. Phenomena with a time constant much smaller than t can be treated by local theories as one end does not know what happens at the other. If a longitudinal current flows through the plasma and returns through an outer wire or a circuit, the situation is different. Except for rapid transients, the current must be the same in the whole tube and in the wire. If the current is modulated in one end, this information is rapidly transferred to the other end and to the wire. The current may produce double layers which accelerate electrons and ions. It may pinch the plasma producing filaments. These effects also produce a coupling between the two ends of the plasma column and reduce the coupling to its local environment. Electrons accelerated in a double layer in the plasma column may travel very rapidly from one end of the plasma column to the other. Therefore, if there is a current through a plasma, we must use global theories, taking into account all regions through which the current in the plasma column flows. Local theories are not valid. A global theory must be used to describe the influence of a double layer on the motions of the plasma column. The theoretical treatment of a current carrying plasma must start with locating the whole region in which the current flows. It is convenient to draw the circuit to determine the resistance, the inductances, and the generators and double layers. These elements are usually distributed and non-linear, and the circuit theory may be rather complicated. The return current need not flow through the wire. It could very well flow through another plasma column. In the next part, we will examine how this applies to cosmic phenomena. As always, be brave, be curious. The truth is waiting for us. Until next time.